Next up, we have Seth, who's at HashiCorp. He's going to be talking. See, it says here it's infrastructure as code with Terraform. But up there, it just says infrastructure as code. The mystery is yours to solve. All right. Can everyone hear me? No, I'm pretty loud. Like, I probably don't even need this, but I'll use it anyway. All right, so let's talk about infrastructure as code. Who has infrastructure here? Yeah, the rest of you are lying. All right, so my name is Seth. Uh, I'm the director at HashiCorp. Uh, but what you need to know is that I have Terraform stickers. Um, so that's the important takeaway from this slide. I want to talk a little bit about this concept of infrastructure as code, and then I want to talk about this open source tool called Terraform that can help manage this complexity. So you might have heard of some of these tools that exist in this space. We're just constantly creating tools. We have you know, Terraform, and then OpenStack has heat. Chef provisioning, uh, AWS has cloud formation, uh, and all of these tools do different things in slightly different ways, uh, and they claim to have the same goals. They claim to have this infrastructure as code, this single workflow. So you're sitting there, you're evaluating these tools, and you know, like everybody else, I'm taking a 50-minute talk and squeezing it into 20 minutes, so I'm talking quickly, and you're like, what did I, what did I do to deserve this, <laughs> right? You're, you're sitting there, and you're like, all right, I think I want to run on AWS, but I have some OpenStack, and I don't even, what it, like, what is going on? Um, and it's really important to take a step back and ask ourselves, what did we do to get here? Um, we, we spend a lot of time looking forward, and I think we do a really bad job of looking backward and really analyzing the steps that we took to get here. So what were our original goals? We have all of these tools that are claiming to solve this infrastructure as code problem, but how? What problem were they trying to solve? And it really boils down to three key points. The first is that we want to capture infrastructure requirements in a text file. And the reasons why we want to do this will become clearer in a moment, but this is really the literal definition of infrastructure as code, right? Taking all of our infrastructure dependencies and putting them in a text file. And it doesn't matter whether those dependencies are compute, like instances and compute resources, or whether that infrastructure, uh, okay, or whether that infrastructure is um, spread across like networking resources, databases as a service, DNS providers, et cetera. But there's more to infrastructure as code. Additionally, we want to provide a workflow that sits on top of that. And it doesn't matter whether you're a designer or a developer or an operator or a sysadmin or a DevOp. It's not a real thing. Don't ever let anybody tell you you're a DevOp. Um, but it doesn't matter what your job title is. You want the same workflow. It doesn't matter whether I'm building a massive Kubernetes cluster with 50,000 nodes or if I'm deploying my personal blog on DigitalOcean with a single Record, I want the same workflow. And then lastly, and probably most importantly, is to steal everything that application developers have had for the past 50 years. So things like source control, code review, CI, continuous integration, that's the same thing, continuous delivery, um, the ability to collaborate on changes, to see changes before they happen. So all of the things that application developers have been bragging about and using for years, we want to bring that to infrastructure management. And it turns out that that's a really hard problem. Uh, you can't just wake up one morning and be like, I am going to solve all of the computer science problems. Some people try. And it turns out that you actually need a solid foundation in mathematics in order to solve this problem. So the last talk really set me up for this graph theory thing. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about graph theory, and I'm going to talk about why. So, Infrastructure has been around for a very long time. Uh, back in the day, infrastructure was as large as you know, football stadiums, but it's been around for a very long time. And when we first started out, it was manual, right? You clicky-clicky, you typey-typey, you put some stuff on a punch card, you're good to go. Then we had the basics of automation. Right? Shell came around, and, then and now some people use Z-Shell and Fish, but we had the basics of automation, right? Our, we had two complete languages, and we could do stuff like install packages and create users and make files. But we were still running like these big massive servers and there was no real isolation. And then the, the layer of the hypervisor came along, right? virtualization came along. And now 
we had all of these big computers and we were utilizing them more effectively. So instead of running our one little application on a massive 16 gigabyte host, uh, we can now run multiple instances, multiple operating systems on that host. And more recently we saw, are we seeing an increase in the commoditization of infrastructure? So we have entire companies, cloud providers as we like to call them, that are coming out with this idea that, hey, we'll provide you those VMs on our hypervisor, on our bare metal, so that you can adequately provision in machines. And more recently, you look at things like Docker and Nomad and Kubernetes, that really what we're building, what we're moving towards is this data center as a computer type mindset, where tools allow us to just expose all of our VMs, all of our resources as data. And we can consume that data regardless of you know, whether we have one instance or 10,000 instances. And it would seem like we've made a lot of progression over the past 20 or 30 years. We went from mainframes that were the size of football stadiums to, I, I have more memory on my phone than some of the first computers. Uh, everything should be easy, it should be great, we should feel awesome, but why don't we? I would argue that the people 20 years ago were much happier than we are today. They weren't paged in the middle of the night when things went down. They weren't you know, annoyed when somebody deployed something badly to production. And don't take my word for it, you can view these you know, very famous Twitter accounts that tell us how we view our jobs. Right? At startup, we practice outage-driven development. So why? We've built all of these tooling, we've had great advancements in the infrastructure space, why is everything terrible? Well, and it turns out that as we give more capability, we also introduce complexity. So if you take a look at Amazon or Google or DigitalOcean or Azure, right, they're these great cloud providers and they give us a lot of flexibility in exchange for hundreds of new APIs that we now have to understand. In exchange for idiosyncrasies that are different between them. And it takes a little bit to really think about what a modern infrastructure looks like. This is an example of a quote unquote modern infrastructure on Amazon. You have, you know, a CDN that's fronted by some public facing load balancer with some auto scaling groups and some backend services. And this becomes very complex to reason about. Until you really think that this looks a whole lot like a relational database. It looks a whole lot like a graph. And we can represent a relational database via an ERD. We can explain the relationships between the models in the database. So why can't we do that with code? And it turns out we can, we just have to think about it differently. We have to think about it like computer scientists instead of thinking about it like application developers. And that's really what Terraform does, is Terraform masks a lot of complex graph theory and interdependencies, providing us an interpolation syntax that builds a complex dependency graph, but you as the user don't have to think about any of that. It exposes a declarative syntax for us to be able to provision infrastructure at any scale very quickly, and it works for the modern infrastructure or the modern data center. So whether you're running everything on compute instances or you're using databases as a service and DNS, et cetera, Terraform can manage all of that and the dependencies between them. So this is where I stop talking. I pull out my two favorite books and we're gonna do a live demo. Who's excited? These are, these are not real books. Uh, O'Reilly doesn't publish them. Oh, really does. All right, so let's jump into, can everybody see this? Perfect. All right, so this is a terminal. How many people have used one of these before? Cool. All right, so I'm gonna go through a very basic Terraform example using the Google Compute Engine. Uh, how many people run on GCP? Cool, I have an example for Amazon in a second, so you're fine. All right, so this is a really, a really quick example for Google Compute. I have two resources. The first is a firewall, which lets the public internet talk to this instance, and the second is an instance, which is actually going to just install Apache and give us a default page. So it's a pretty hello world example for infrastructure. You can see here we declare a number of resources. Those resources have a type and a name, and then they have attributes. Uh, very similar to like Chef or Puppet, you have a resource and that resource has parameters or attributes. The same is true for Terraform. And then down here on the instance layer, I'm just creating an Ubuntu 16.04 instance. I'm giving it an ephemeral IP and some user data. So let's see what happens. Terraform separates the plan from the apply phase. So the, the previous speaker said about how it'd be really great if you could see what was gonna happen before you do it. Terraform does that for you. So let's take a look at the Terraform plan. You can see that was pretty fast. That's because I'm tethered to my phone and not using the conference Wi-Fi. And the Terraform plan will actually go out to 
Google in this case, and see the state of these resources. And here you can see that the plan is telling us it's going to create two resources. We can see it's a create operation because there's two plus signs there. And there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that's pretty infrastructure provider specific. Now, we think that's okay, that looks good to me, I don't know about you, and I'm going to go ahead and run Terraform apply. Terraform apply is going to go out and it's actually going to make API calls to Google, in this case, to provision these infrastructure resources. So it's going out, it's talking to the cloud provider, it's booting this instance, and now I'm just waiting at the whim of Google to hope that my demo doesn't completely die. I'm going to continue talking awkwardly throughout this so that you don't think something bad has happened. So it actually takes somewhere between 40 and 60 seconds. While this is provisioning, I'll tell you what's actually happening under the hood. Terraform built a graph. In this case, the graph only had two resources, a firewall and an instance. Because neither of those resources depended on each other, they're actually being created in parallel. So Terraform made two API calls in parallel, one to spin up the firewall, one to spin up the compute instance, and we're waiting for them both to complete. As you can see here, my talking has been successful. It is now complete, and I get an IP address out at the end. I'm actually not done yet. This instance has some user data that will run after it's booted that's just going to install Apache and render out a default page. So I'm going to waste a little bit more time just to make sure that that completes. How I'm going to do that is I'm going to show you some of the uh, interdependencies that can happen. So I have another resource in here. This is a Terraform file that sets up DNS, and you'll notice that it's commented out. So let's go ahead and cheat here. I'm bad at Vim. OK, so now I've uncommented this. And what this is doing is this is creating a DNS record on the HashiCorp.rocks domain name. So terraform.hashicorp.rocks will point to this Google instance. And it has a value of this really long string in here that I've highlighted. That is what we call an attribute in Terraform. This builds the dependency graph. It tells us that this DNS record depends on the compute instance. And I'll show you what that looks like in a second. So let me quit this. Maybe. I told you I'm bad at Vim. All right, so we'll run this Terraform graph command. And this will generate this kind of ugly looking thing. Uh, so I have a cheaty one that I use that'll generate a PNG for us. You can see that we have uh, two resources in here, the Google Compute Firewall and the Google Compute Instance. We don't have our DNS in there yet, so let's fix that. It's because I didn't save because I'm bad at Vim. Now we'll run that same command, and now you can see that we get a dependency graph here that's read from the bottom to the top, and you can see that our DNS simple record won't get created until after the Compute Instance is built to build the instance to get the IP so that I can put my DNS record in. Terraform is taking care of us, or taking care for us. So now let's go ahead and apply these changes. It's not gonna change anything about the compute instance because the compute instance hasn't changed. Terraform is smart enough to know that that resource will be created, it does so through a state. Now we're just waiting for the DNS record to be updated. It's gonna happen any second now. And while we're waiting up terraform.hashicorp.rocks, and now you can see that this page was actually provisioned. Uh, you know it's real because it says Automacon, um, so you can tell that this isn't just someone else's instance. Um, so this was provisioned and managed by Terraform. Um, this is a really basic example. I have one instance, one DNS record, and one firewall. But how many people, how many people have a really complex infrastructure that's more than three resources? Yeah, so let me show you one of those real quick because I have four minutes. So we'll go up to the world famous demo two folder. Yeah, who's excited? Demo two. And what demo two is, is actually a very complex Terraform infrastructure. Yeah, right, Ooh. That's running on Amazon. And we have a VPC and we have a bunch of stuff in that VPC. We have some availability zones. We're running console and Nomad. Um, this is just lots of squiggly lines for those of you that don't work in infrastructure. Um, <clears throat> but what's going to happen here is Terraform manages all of this complexity for us. So we don't have to worry about should I create this before this or this before that. It does that automatically. And let me show you what this is actually running. Uh, if you, you can all run this. If you hit up chatty.live browser, uh, this is a live real-time Slack clone um, that I wrote. It's written Say hello. We'll join. Just www. Perfect. Interactive demos. Everybody loves that. Don't say anything. 
Awesome. And you know, these games are, are pretty cool, but let's say for whatever reason that this application becomes like the bee's knees and like everybody's on it. It is going viral. Top page of Hacker News. New York Times has picked it up. How do we scale? Uh, how do we get more instances of this application running? Um, maybe it's, you know, scaling appropriately because actually none of this data has persisted. It's all in memory, so it's really secure. Um, perfect. See, look, I just refresh and then it's gone, right? So how do we fix this? Well, if we jump into our, um, whatever I call this thing here, the scheduler.tf, down here at the bottom, I have a number of these clients, and they're in a variable. And all I have to do is change that variable down, and Terraform will spin up more and some down. So let's go ahead and edit that variable, and you all get to see some of my cloud credentials, so don't steal them. Don't worry, I'll rotate them. So let's go ahead, and we will change the, um, I don't even remember what I said that was. The uh, scheduler, what did I say that was? This is why live demos are great, right? It was workers, all right. So we'll go down here, workers, and we'll just make this 10, right? We're scaling quickly. So now I'm gonna run the Terraform plan, and I messed up, Let's see? Now you know it's a live demo. So we'll run the Terraform plan. And Terraform is going to pull, that up, pull up that value. And hopefully, it's going to tell me, hey, I'm going to create a whole bunch of additional clients here. So it goes out, and it refreshes the remote state. So it talks to Amazon, and it says, hey, Amazon, like which instances do you have? Which ones do you not know about? And here it comes back, and it says, hey, I'm going to create a bunch of instances. Uh, and it creates a load balancer attachment group. I can go ahead and apply this as well. And like that, all we have for those instances to boot. They're coming up with a custom AMI that already has uh, the chatty application installed. The moment they become healthy and the load balancer picks them up, they'll start receiving traffic. Uh, and we have you know, the next big startup. Anybody want to give me money? Uh, I am expecting VC funding. So while this is running, um, I have stickers. And I think I have one minute left. So are there any questions? Have I, the question is, have I posted demo two to Stack Overflow yet? Um, the, yeah, after this. In the back? So the question is, what is the best way for Terraform multi-environment? Uh, so Terraform, unlike you know, CloudFormation or Heat, isn't provider specific. It supports Amazon. And you can put all of these things in what are called PF files, just files that end with extension. So you can structure, hey, I want to run this instance on Google and this instance on Amazon. Um, the, the best way to do that is to just put them in separate files, but that's not enforced at all. Terraform can also be multi-region within a single provider. Maybe you want to run multiple instances in different um, you know, AWS regions or different Google regions for availability. You can do that as well. Um, and there's a bunch of different strategies there. We have a bunch of them on the website, and I'm happy to show you some specific ones if you have a specific example. So Terraform works, Terraform works really well if you have ephemeral machines. I find I have problems if I have machines that are managed centrally, like you can't do a knife node delete or knife client delete. Is that an intended use case of Terraform to manage servers that are managed centrally? Uh, so the question is, if you have, you're talking central, like stateful, or? If I have a machine that's in chef, I do Terraform container, Terraform destroy, Terraform can't handle that. Is um, I would have to think about this case a little bit more. I mean, Terraform definitely works better with ephemeral environments. The idea is that Terraform is a tool for launching infrastructure. And once you move into the application layer, which is really what you're hitting when you start getting into like Chef or like Kubernetes land, um, that's not necessarily Terraform's responsibility. It can help you out. But Terraform is really for launching and provisioning infrastructure and managing the life cycle of that infrastructure. Um, if you're tainting a resource, which for those of you that aren't familiar with Terraform, that's how you mark a resource as um, wanting to be recreated during the next Terraform plan or Terraform apply, um, that's not necessarily tied into Chef. Like, design. Uh, ideally, we would recommend that you use Packer with Chef to build machine images, you know, Google Compute Images, DigitalOcean Droplets, AMIs, and then launch those platforms. So you put 
configuration management layer into the build time instead of the runtime. All right. I've heard he has stickers.